Role of the Borough Council, the County and the Parishes Local government in England operates under either a one-tier system, unitary authorities, or a two-tier system, county and district councils. In Lincolnshire, we have a two-tier system. County councils cover the whole of the county and provide the majority of public services in their particular area. County councils are responsible for education, highways, transport planning, passenger transport, social care, libraries, waste disposal and strategic planning. Each county is divided into several districts. District councils, which may also be called borough councils or city councils if the district has borough or city status, cover a much smaller area and provide more local services. District councils are responsible for housing, leisure and recreation, environmental health, waste collection, planning applications and local taxation collections. Parish councils are another layer of local government which provide valuable local services. Often people think they are only volunteers, but the parish council is a legal entity with formal accountability. The following are all under the remit of local councils. Allotments, burial grounds, cemeteries, churchyards and crematoria, bus shelters, community centres, conference centres, halls, public buildings, drainage of ditches and ponds, entertainment and the arts, footpaths, Each layer of council has legal responsibility for its functions and can only deliver what it has the authority to provide. As an example, the Borough Council cannot make decisions on planning applications relating to waste and minerals because this is the function of the County Council. The Constitution sets out how the Council operates, how decisions are made and the procedures which are followed to ensure that these are efficient transparent and accountable to local people. Some of these processes are required by law, while others are a matter for the Council to choose. Following the Local Government Act 2000, which changed the way Councils made decisions, the Government issued a model constitution, which was adopted by the Council and created the leader and cabinet system of decision-making. Since that time, there have been many amendments to reflect changes in legislation, case law, decisions made by the courts, and good practice. The Constitution contains, amongst other things, the rules of procedure for council meetings, including when the public and members can ask questions, the length of time for speaking, how to lodge a motion on notice, the scheme of delegation, the Members' Code of Conduct and Associated Protocols, the Officers' Code of Conduct, and many other procedures which must be followed. Can Members change the Constitution? The Constitution um, is a legal document and as the monitoring officer I have a legal obligation to maintain the Constitution and ensure it remains compliant. Members can change or make recommendations to change the Constitution in a variety of ways. The first way would be to have a motion on notice for the full Council where a proposed amendment could be a amendment to the Constitution could be debated amongst full council with a recommendation to instruct me to review that and bring a further report back. A second way of doing uh, a change to the constitution is if a matter comes through a scrutiny process, a report on the one of the uh, scrutiny committees which uh, gives rise to a requirement to update or amend the constitution. Another way might be through the audit and governance committee or the standard subcommittee, again through where a report has been taken by an officer that as an outcome gives rise to a change in some way to either a protocol, 
the scheme of delegation, the responsibility for functions, um, or any of the various articles. And those are all ways that the constitution can be changed through full council. As the monitoring officer, I have delegation to me to be, to be able to make amendments where there is case law or changes in the legislation that require the constitution to be updated to ensure it remains lawful and um, up to date. How can members of the public get to know more about the constitution? Our constitution is published online and helpfully it is published in sections so you don't have to um, have to read the whole document because as you know it is huge and you can either do a word search within the um, website or you can go on to once you get to the constitution or you can find it as a document and go through the relevant headings to find the part where you might be requiring some assistance. Alternatively, you can always uh, request uh, a, a comment from the Democratic Services team if you can't quite find what you're looking for. Democratic Services Democratic Services is a small and very dedicated team at the heart of our local democracy, managing the democratic processes of the Council and supporting members to undertake their duties. Supporting many formal public meetings every year, they publish the agendas and minutes of Council, Cabinet and all of the many committees. They provide dedicated support to the two scrutiny committees. They also ensure the Council's forward plan of decisions are available and accessible to the public. The civic support function is also provided to support the Mayor and Deputy Mayor as they undertake their civil roles principally across the whole borough and also sometimes further afield. You will have met Lorraine Bush who is the Democratic Services Manager and she is ably supported by Jeanette Collier, Karen Rist, Alison Hull. What's the role of the committee clerk? Actually, that's a really good question because sometimes um, people looking in can just think that the committee clerk is just, just there taking notes. Actually, the committee clerk doesn't take notes, they take the formal minute record of the meeting. So when they are busy sitting next to the chairman, not only are they organising procedure that night, making sure that the chairman is aware of who wants to speak, the rules of procedure, and where we are on the agenda and making sure that the votes are taken in accordance with the legislation and the constitution. They are taking the formal record of the meeting. In addition, they will be responsible for liaising with the chairman and vice chairman to make sure future dates are uh, in place for committees, to ascertain who's coming, who's not, to look at agenda planning, to make the agendas uh, ensure they're published for members of the public, um, and again, in terms of licensing, our committee clerks, uh, and planning, I should say as well, our committee clerks are an important liaison with members of the public who may wish to speak uh, and come and address the committee and therefore log their right to speak. They wish, may wish to submit written submissions to the committees for consideration. Also, um, within the constitution, there is the ability for members of the public to ask questions of the committees and our committee clerks will be responsible for ensuring that those questions are received in time in accordance with the constitution timescales and then make sure that those are allocated uh, and dealt with ready for the committee to start and consider those questions that are asked. They have a very very varied job and not just the uh, sitting next to the chairman taking the minutes of the meeting. The Council's decision-making structure. Local authority governance is the framework within which decisions are made and implemented. There are broadly three types of Council structure. One, leader and cabinet, executive. Two, executive mayor and cabinet, executive. Three, committee system. The most common model in England and Wales is that of leader and cabinet and this is the model operated by Boston Borough Council and all other districts in Lincolnshire. Decisions in local authorities are made at different levels depending on the nature of the decision. 
The Constitution provides for a Responsibility of Functions section, which sets out where decisions will be taken. There are several types of decisions. Decisions reserved to full council, Executive Cabinet decisions, Key decisions, Non-executive decisions. Lawfully, there are a variety of decision makers. What's the difference between executive and non-executive functions? That's a really important one because I think uh, many, many people aren't quite clear why the Cabinet does something and full council does something. Back in 2000, the Local Government Act 2000 introduced the concept of executive and non-executive functions. And what that means is in law, the executive, the cabinet, are responsible for a set of functions and the non-executive, i.e. full council, are responsible for another set of functions. And how those decisions are made within the council, by which body, is really important because that is enshrined in law. In executive systems, decisions may be made by the following. Full council, the executive collectively, the cabinet, committees and subcommittees, officers. So what's the difference between the executive and the cabinet? Nothing. The two terms mean the same thing and they're interchangeable. In the legislation, um, the, the use of the term executive is used consistently through um, the legislation and the, uh, the cabinet is the body that is effectively the executive and you will see that again within legislation and our constitution the cabinet uh, with a leader cabinet style of uh, governance is the one that Boston Borough Council has and throughout uh, there, are, there are four different options of governance but in terms of executive and cabinet they are interchangeable and mean the same thing. The Local Government Act 2000 sets out in law whether a decision is an executive decision or a non-executive decision. In addition, it sets out which functions are reserved to full council and which are the lawful responsibility of the cabinet executive. Officers can exercise both executive and non-executive functions. Can the full council exercise executive functions? No, it can't. As I've said before, it's very clearly enshrined in legislation in the Local Government Act 2000 what decisions may be made by the Cabinet, by the Executive, and what may be taken by Council and the non-executive functions. In fact, the, there is a body of case law that supports that. Um, one prime example is a case involving uh, Buck and Doncaster. The uh, Executive at Doncaster were going through um, budget setting and as part of the executive policy they wish to reduce their library service as part of their service to their, their constituents and their community. They as part of the executive agreed the policy relating to library provision and library provision is clearly an executive function. However when the budget was taken to full council where the budget is a full council decision to agree and set the budget. Full council sought to amend the budget and where provision had been uh, given to remove and reduce the library provision, full council determined to increase library provision, thus expecting the executive not only to stop the um, closure of libraries but actually to reverse that. There was a challenge because the executive said Thank you, but no thank you. Our policy is to reduce libraries, and they had a great deal of evidence base around that as to why they were doing that as part of a policy. And even though full council had made the budget available for them not to reduce library provision, they still determined to continue with their policy of library closures. There was a judicial review, and the um, applicant in that matter sought to force the council's executive to create more libraries and stop the closures. 
the case in that was decided that actually whilst the full council in budget setting had increased the capacity of funding for library services, as an executive function it was the cabinet who had sole responsibility to determine the delivery and strategic objectives of library provision and therefore the cabinet did not have to follow full council's determination to increase that budget. And that was a really important case for establishing that you cannot have a decision which is executive taken by full council. There are matters reserved to full council and that is in our constitution clearly set out under articles, under the articles and matters reserved to full council. You may want to um, know what a judicial review is. I've referenced that in my response. Judicial review is a form of legal challenge whereby um, anybody with an interest in the decision made by a council, any public body, can bring a legal claim to have that decision sent back or redetermined and uh, sent back effectively to the council that made that decision again. And that is what we, we talk about when we sit, talk about judicial review. How could judicial review impact the council? That's a very good question because fortunately we've been able to um, defend or um, demonstrate pr uh, robust decision making. The last thing anybody wants is a judicial review because that demonstrates there's been some failure of decision making. However, if we lose a, digi a judicial review, there can be significant impact on costs. Not only would we end up paying our own legal costs, but we would also most likely be found to have to pay the, the uh, applicant's costs as well. And they can amount to tens and tens of thousands of pounds, not just 5,000 or 10,000, but getting into the realms of uh, 100,000 pounds for one case. Also, if we successfully defend a judicial review, often the applicant who has brought those proceedings has not got sufficient funds to be able to pay our costs so even though we may get a cost order against the applicant because the um, matter has been found not to have substance, any cost that we've incurred, if the applicant doesn't have the financial means to pay, then we as the public purse pick that cost up and they can sometimes be significant. But that's why we demonstrate um, open and transparent decision making at every opportunity. And as your council solicitor, if anybody is considering uh, a judicial review action, I'm at great pains to invite them in and invite dialogue to understand where their concerns relating to that decision may be. Full Council Full Council is the meeting of all councillors held every few months. This is the ultimate decision-making body of the Council. Full Council elects and can remove the leader of the Council takes decisions over the constitution and bylaws, decides the budget, appoints the chief officers, debates motions and decides council policy, the policy framework. No individual or committee within the council can override full council, providing it is acting within its powers. If it exceeds its lawful powers, the monitoring officer will intervene and advise that a decision that is ultra vires is about to be taken. There are procedure rules that set out the many different aspects of how full council as a meeting will be managed. The chairman of the full council is the mayor and he will apply the rules of procedure stringently. For those of you who are new to local government, some of these rules may seem strange and hard to work with, but they all have their origin in case law and formal procedure to ensure the decision making of the full council is robust, transparent and fair. There are procedure rules for the following as an example. The length of time a meeting may take. Unless the majority of members present vote for a meeting to continue, any meeting that has lasted for three hours will adjourn immediately. These are a very detailed set of rules and ones you should most definitely read, discuss in your groups and be very clear about before meetings of full council. 
they are applied strictly to proceedings to ensure fairness. One of the most commonly confusing aspects arise on when a member may speak. To be clear, full counsel is not a question and answer session. A member may speak on each motion or subject matter, subject to amendments, just once for up to five minutes. If you ask a question of another member and sit down, you will have used your chance to speak, even if that question took just 30 seconds. The solution is to ask your questions but continue the points you wish to make. The proposer and seconder will respond to those questions when they close the debate. What's the process for raising an issue for debate by the Council? That would be um, found within Part 4 Rules of Procedure within the Constitution. And you must do that. There has to be five members who are prepared to sign um, something we call a motion on notice. And there has to be a proposer and a seconder and three fellow councillors who can sign that to say that they support that motion. It must be lodged seven clear days before the council meeting to the chief executive and it must be about something that directly affects the borough, um, which is why uh, some motions uh, are not acceptable if they do not relate to something contained within the borough or something within, necessarily within the council's control. Also, the proposer and seconder must be present at the council meeting where that motion is to be debated. Sometimes I'm asked, do all five members have to be from the same party? No, not at all. It is simply the proposer, seconder and three other signatories that have to sign that motion to make that a valid motion to be able to go onto the agenda. And once that's published on the agenda, the, um, it, it forms part of the council business for that evening. There's been reference to reserved matters. What does this mean? These are matters that are reserved specifically to full council. So I've referenced the Buck and Doncaster case where I talked about the budget framework being a matter for full council, but policy delivery a matter for the executive. Three examples of matters uh, reserved to full council include the constitution, and again that's something I've talked about as well in terms of those amendments to the constitution. Um, the budget framework, most definitely reserved to full council, and also the overarching policy framework. More information can be found within part three of the constitution where it sets out responsibilities for functions and you'll be able to see specifically who is able to do what and what matters have been reserved to full council. What other matters are reserved matters? There, there's a, a real varied mix. So as another example is confirming the honour of Freeman of the Borough of Boston. We don't often have uh, that because it's such a special honour, but a couple of years ago, Alison Fairman was awarded the freedom of the Borough of Boston. Um, also, the members' allowances. A panel meets, the remuneration panel meets um, every three years to review members' allowances, and that is a matter reserved to full council for decision. Also, the appointment of chairman and uh, Vice Chairman to the various committees, with the exception of BTAC, uh, that's approved by and reserved to full council. And in addition, also the variation of any terms of reference to the various committees as well. Again, something reserved to full council. Cabinet. The executive leader, or simply leader, as the office is most commonly titled, is a position elected at the full council meeting. All executive power vests in the leader. The leader may discharge the executive functions of the council or he may provide for any executive functions of the council to be discharged by the cabinet as a whole. A committee of the cabinet. An officer of the authority an individual member of the cabinet, an area committee, joint arrangements or another local authority. 
The leader appoints the cabinet and will determine how the various functions will be split amongst the portfolio holders. The leader, together with the cabinet members, forms the cabinet. The cabinet does not have to be politically representative. It can be made up entirely of councillors from the ruling party or parties. Cabinet members have individual areas of responsibility, portfolios, and officers will liaise with their portfolio holder on matters of strategic direction and policy formulation. Key decisions to be made by the cabinet will be published on the forward plan which is updated on a monthly basis and published. Scrutiny committees will want to review the forward plan as part of their work programme. The Cabinet procedures are contained within Part 4, Section D of the Constitution. As an example, this sets out, amongst other procedures, who can exercise executive functions, conflicts of interest, arrangements of Cabinet meetings, quorum, how meetings are conducted, the order of business. It is worth taking a look at this part of the Constitution, Part 4, Section D, and if you have any queries, don't hesitate to ask Michelle Sachs, the Monitoring Officer, or Lorraine Bush, the Democratic Services Manager. Can a member of the public ask a question at Cabinet meetings? Yes, absolutely. Again, within the Constitution there is provision for members of the public asking questions. Um, briefly, those questions must be received by 5pm no later than two days before the meeting of Cabinet. They must be as succinct as possible and they must again relate to matters that directly affect what we do within the borough. Um, we ensure that the responses are published for those who ask those questions and they also have the ability to ask a supplementary question as well. However, the supplementary question must be related to the first question that was asked, i.e. the primary question. It's not an opportunity to ask a separate question. It must be directly linked. But we encourage as many members of the public as possible to ask those questions because it's about making the Cabinet accessible to the public. Overview and scrutiny. You may have seen the separate training session on the whole topic of overview and scrutiny and we recommend you take some time to watch this, even if you don't have a seat on a scrutiny committee at this time. The overview and scrutiny procedure rules are found in Part 4, Section E. Constitution of the Overview and Scrutiny Committees Who may sit? on overview and scrutiny committees, co-optees, meetings of the overview and scrutiny committees, quorum, work programme, agenda items. There are many other aspects to review, but take a look at the procedure rules and ask Michelle Sachs or Lorraine Bush any questions you have. Isn't scrutiny just a waste of time, as it doesn't have the power to overrule the executive? Absolutely not. The scrutiny committee and the process of scrutiny is all about influence and being able to create a legacy. All of you, whether you're on the scrutiny committees or not, have the ability to engage with the scrutiny work programme. And if there are issues that really uh, are burning issues for you and your community, then it's something you should be speaking to the chairman of those two committees, the EMP and CNC, and asking if this is something that can be brought up on the work programme, because the work that can be undertaken as part of a review can be fundamental in shaping policy. And often, the scrutiny committee can do a piece of work valid that then gives rise to decisions being taken by the executive that actually leave a lasting legacy for the community of Boston is absolutely not a waste of time at all and please my, my one piece of advice would be engage with the scrutiny process if you are on that scrutiny committee because you can achieve so much you do not have to be on the executive to make a difference. I hope you've enjoyed this session 
Um, I'm mindful there's many other committees that you may have an interest in, you may sit on, you may be interested to know what they do. And when you leave this session, take time to have a look at all the other list of committees and click on the link just to see what each of those does. And if you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to come and ask Lorraine or myself and we'll be happy to expand further. Thank you.